So I'd like to call the meeting to order at 7 o'clock. Um, like to review the minutes. I don't have the date on it. If somebody has a date of the last minutes. I do. Yeah. It will be the 7th. August 6th, yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so I need a motion. Move to accept, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Phil. Second. Who said that? You, Phil? Second? Sure. Okay, thanks. Roll call, Damien. A yes. Lynn? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy? Yes. Phil? Yes. Uh, Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Uh, Bill? Yep. Mary? Yes. Ashley? Yes. And myself, yes. Um, Shelly, you want to do the financial report, please? Yep, no problem. Um, I do have two dogs. They often start barking, but I'll do my best to keep them quiet. I like to give that caveat first. So we have a lot to go over. Um, I did send out the financial report. I'm going to kind of give a summary of each of the pieces that we talked about. Um, it is lengthy. I will try to go as um, clearly, but quickly and precisely as possible. Uh, so the first order of business is always our warrants. So we have 11 warrants totaling 1,000, I'm sorry, not 1,000, <laughs> 1,604,030.20 that were signed by Mr. Halla. Thank you, Bob, for coming in and taking care of that for us. Yep. Um, and then, so next we're going to move in and talk about FY20 things. First, we're going to talk about the general fund wrap up and then our revolving funds. And then we'll move on to fiscal year 21. Um, you can interrupt me if you have a question, um, but if I, I'm going to try to take breaks so that you do have an opportunity to ask as we move along. Uh, so we met about three months ago, uh, around May 12th, I believe, and at that point, uh, Frontier had almost $740,000 remaining to be spent in the general fund between uh, that date and June 30th. Uh, we had estimated that roughly 430 of that would be spent on um, remaining expenditures, and then we would have around 310,000 in quote unquote savings because of our budget freeze. Uh, the school committee at that time agreed to reallocate school lunch wages, which were just under $10,000 that were needed. Uh, in support of the school lunch revolving fund due to the loss of revenue with COVID-19 school closure. Uh, so the remaining funds of 300,000 were to be reallocated to school choice in support of the level funded budget for fiscal year 21 after taking excess and deficiency into consideration. Um, in actuality, uh, the remaining budget and the expenditures ended up being, um, expenses were lower than we planned. And so we ended up reallocating to two different accounts. One was all of our school choice expenditures, which was $180,000. We moved onto the general fund. And then we were also able to move some funding back to our special education revolving account. That was roughly $156,000. So currently, as I continue to assess closing out our books and excess and deficiency, if you were to pull a report, which I did send to you and, and go to the last page, um, you would see that the current available balance in the general fund budget for FY20 is just over $200,000. Um, so we only, <laughs> we ended up having more savings than we anticipated. Um, which was due to some a variety of reasons. In part, we really tightened up on expenses, um, and then some of our salaries and wages came in less than we have budgeted as well. So at this point, what we're looking at for excess and deficiency, because that is one of our key factors we're only allowed to carry over, as um, most of our school committee or all of our school committee would know, a 5% excess over the current year's budget. So what that means for Frontier is the maximum amount that we can carry in E&D 
is $573,320. So we have an existing fund balance of just over 340,000. So the 200 that remains with the 340 that we have in the fund balance puts us under that 573. Um, so we are under the 5% at this point. I do wanna share that I'm still assessing our encumbrances from fiscal year 19 with my bookkeepers to make sure that encumbrances from 19 can be closed or we hold those funds to carry them over and that our encumbrances for fiscal year 20 are accurate. All of those pieces have an impact on the excess and deficiency and there's this complicated um, calculation, but in the end, I do think that we are gonna be okay and not over that 5% because if we were over the 5% excess and deficiency, we are obligated legally to give that money back to our member towns. Um, but just based on these initial estimates, we are under that at this point. So I'm in close communication with our um, audit representative, Joanne um, Webster from Scanlon, talking about all of the finances, even though they haven't come in yet to formally do the audit, um, we are already talking about the numbers and I'm running things by her to make sure that we're on the right track. Um, because while this is my second year at Frontier, this is really my first analysis of excess and deficiency. So full disclosure there that I am asking for support. I think we're in good hands and um, we are in a good position at this point. Any questions about any of that before I move on? These are the times where I wish Mr. Decker was here because he would definitely have questions for us. <laughs> so I'll go. Phil? I'll go with a question. Phil, go ahead. So, so Shelly, um, just, just the, has there been any thought towards addressing the long stand, the, the lengthy capital uh, repairs, cap, capital projects list with, with, with um, with some of the near excess excess. Yeah, so that's definitely something we're considering because if you remember from the May report, we had about $85,000 in projects that we hadn't done yet that you all right. voted to use last year. Um, one was the gym floor renovation. Another was um, locker rooms for, or not locker rooms, um, lockers for the locker room, lockers for the middle school area. And there might have been one other small thing. Plus, we had some contingency money. So um, definitely, if we are in a position where we're looking to be over that 5%, that will be the first thing that we're discussing to see if we want to do any of those projects we put on hold in March when COVID came out. And then the, I guess my other question is, there was sort of an informal hiring freeze, which I take it the other part of tonight's agenda means that that might be over. Um, but does do these numbers mean that for the Union 38 or where I mean I don't, I don't know where we are with the hire with, with, with all of that but are we going to hire the people that we need if we if we need people now yeah so we're going to talk about FY 21 um, a little bit later because these funds wouldn't be available to support any of those positions we did have a quote unquote hiring freeze um, with the beginning of this fiscal year um, but we're at a point now that we know what the plans are going to be moving forward where you know george will have to make some decisions um, with darius and the business office and sarah and curriculum about what the needs are um, and we we might have to fill some of the vacant positions that we have open i hope so okay yeah anything else there okay so i'm going to keep talking about our revolving funds this is again fiscal year 20 uh, so for school choice, um, revenue was slightly higher than an, um, anticipated. Um, and when I say, ooh, what am I looking at here? I'm sorry, that's a typo. It was slightly lower than anticipated. Um, and the reason for that is because the prior year, we had some students who were claimed on school choice in error. Um, so what DESE does is they make adjustments to your next year's revenue payments. Um, so they made an adjustment of around $19,000 down for Frontier. Um, our expenditures uh, were lower than anticipated because we did move all of our expenses off. 
Um, and given the general fund budget freeze, all of our choice expenditures were moved off onto the general fund. Um, we're looking at a higher than anticipated balance of 425,000. Um, and part of that will be able to support the level funding for fiscal year 21. So school choice for Frontier is in a far better position uh, than we anticipated for an additional $400,000 is a significant amount of money. Um, any questions about that school choice update? No. Okay. Um, school lunch revolving fund. Uh, this is an account that we had also talked about in May due to the loss of revenue with the COVID-19 closure and free breakfast and lunch being provided to students and families who chose to take us up on that service. Um, we did receive some reimbursement for the government. However, we did continue to pay wages and food costs directly from the school lunch account, even though revenue was reduced. Um, and then you had voted, as I said earlier, to offset wages by just under $10,000 in the school lunch account. So that resulted in a net positive income with that transfer of $8,400. And we're ending the year with $19,982 in the school lunch account. Um, we're going to talk about FY21 in a moment and what the impact is there. But we did end up with a, a positive revenue in this account. Special education revolving um, was slightly lower than anticipated. Um, Karen and I haven't had a chance to connect on this yet, but it certainly wasn't an exorbitant amount of money and we're looking at less than $4,000 what our projected revenue was off. Um, and then given the general fund budget freeze, we were able to move all of those expenditures off of the school, I'm uh, not school lunch, I'm sorry, special education revolving account, which frees up additional funds for use in FY21 and in future years. So uh, we have a net result of a positive additional um, $122,000 higher than we anticipated ending the year, looking at roughly $255,000 in the revolving fund available for fiscal year 21. Any questions about special education revolving? I just want to make a comment that it's nice that we have a positive in most of these accounts versus some schools that don't have a positive and they're they're starting off their year in the negatives already and, and we're pretty good in the positives so far what what i've seen yeah great. and i mean i give kudos to all of the the staff who are, make decisions regarding purchases at the schools whether it's administration or um faculty because when the crisis hit you know, everybody really understood that we needed to buckle down. We needed to see what savings we could capture because we knew that the next couple of years would be hard. And all of these savings are going to help us not just in 21, but like we talked about in um, May, 22 is going to be harder and we don't know what 23 looks like yet. So we're really in a good spot, at, at least in these couple of accounts at this point. You know, I think we do have to pay close attention to school lunch. Um, but certainly the school choice fund and the special education revolving, we are in a really good position moving forward to help with future year budgets. <laughs> Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, it's like a baby. I, I, read, Shelley, I mean, we were in the perfect situation financially moving into this year. We were very conservative the year before because we had the interim business manager um, and so we did everything conservative. At the same time, we were also saving up for a lot of these capital projects to get done. So when people are looking at our books right now, they're going to say, wow, you know, you guys have a lot of money there. But when you freeze all that, you didn't spend where we were going to spend, it, you know, it added up. And so um, I, just, I just want to kind of say that because there is a lot of money we're sitting on. But next year could be um, you're looking at the revenues down on the state. We were able to survive the beginning of this year with that. Um, next year is going to supposed to be a tough year. So. Um, so I think we have to, you know, I think you already said it, Shelly, a couple of times probably that we do need to keep our savings as much as we can, hunker down for the winter of 22, so to speak. Um, and then hopefully it's not going to be that bad, but we have to be ready for it um, or else it's going to be or if because if you don't have the savings, you have to do the cutting. And we don't want to have to do that. Definitely. Okay. So um, to quickly continue here on fiscal year 21, um, so there's no major changes or concerns to report on the budget yet. I did email you out the budget report for the general fund for the month of July. 
There are some accounts, I, as, as I explained in my email, that I'm working with the business office, the bookkeepers, and the payroll department to clean up. Um, a lot of times what happens when we do a rollover is things from the prior year get remembered. So we need to fix that now in these early months. So I hope to have a much cleaner report to present to you. Um, but the accounts that are not problematic in regard to just recording entries, there's nothing to be concerned about at this point. Um, expenditures have been minimal outside of salaries and wages. And you know, only being a one month snapshot, we're looking at being on target at this point. Um, and we've really done very little ex spending, not knowing what the school year was gonna look like. So things will start to ramp up. Um, but you know, as of right now, we're in good shape with the general fund. Uh, so for school choice, um, what I included in the school choice report for you is an additional $85,000 in COVID related expenditures. Those funds have not yet been spent. Um, they're above what we budgeted for expenditures when we approved the budget because I'm putting them in there as a placeholder for us. I feel like we need to be prepared in the event that all of our grant funding is exhausted so that we have additional funds available. So we will use grant funding prior to dipping into the school choice, but I did want to make you aware that I have several line items in the school choice budget for COVID related expenditures. Uh, I also wanted to share that George and I were in conversation in early July about the school choice numbers, the outgoing students compared to the incoming, just to ensure that revenue was on target to where we anticipated. School choice is a moving target, um, but as of right now, it looks like our numbers will remain the same as far as revenue goes. So we're looking at ending fiscal year 21 with just over $800,000 available to continue to support future year funding. Um, and that problem that we don't know yet about what's gonna happen with chapter 70 revenues and some of our revolving account, account revenues. Um, so right now, as things stand, we would still be in a really healthy position um, with school choice funding at the end of this fiscal year. Any questions there? Phil? So um, just the, the, regarding the, the uh, COVID line items, the, have we gone through all of the uh, CARES Act money that was available through the four towns? And um, sort of how much of a cushion is there before we start spending from our own? Yep, um, I'm definitely going to talk about the grant funding. The short answer is no, we haven't gone through it yet. Um, the last page on, on this report that I submitted to you all does talk about the grant funding. So if it's okay, I'll lump all of that together at the right. end. But yep. no, not yet. We have not gone through all of the grant funding. And this 85000 that I have earmarked will be when all of those funds are exhausted. Okay. okay. Um, so the school lunch fund is the last. Uh, I'm sorry, not the last, we still have special education. Um, school lunch fund is the next revolving a fund that we wanna talk about. Um, projections for revenues and expenditures are still a work in process for school lunch. We don't yet know how many kids are going to choose, even if they're choosing the hybrid model, how many are gonna choose to have lunch at school versus bringing their own. We also don't know if DESE is going to extend the free meals program, and if that's the case, the only revenue coming into the school lunch revolving account would be government funding, um, but we're still gonna have salary and wage expenditures and um, uh, food costs and, and other related overhead costs for the school lunch program. So um, we do have expenses that need to be paid and the account is ending with about $20,000 from this fiscal year. I'm still assessing what the needs are and we might need to use some school choice funds, which is great that we have such a surplus, but we may need to use school choice funds to help offset some of the wages in this department um, going into this year. So I will have a further update for you on school lunch, if not the September meeting, because I'm not sure how quickly we're meeting and if kids will even be back in the building at that point. Um, but as soon as I can provide more concrete information on this, I certainly will. Um, and finally, the special education revolving account, um, we, 
have the potential for one new enrollment. So the numbers here that I provided for you include some higher than expected revenue, things that I was looking at uh, when we approved all of the budgets. We do expect that revenue would be higher um, and that our expenses could be lower um, due to the changes that were made in projections when budget was created. So we've had some shifting um, in staffing since we first approved the budgets here. Um, so if we need additional expenses in this account, say we need additional teaching staff, or if we need to offload something from general fund onto school choice revolving, there are funds available to do that given we ended the year in a better position than when we started. And we're looking at um, finishing fiscal year 21 still in a healthy spot for Frontier at uh, $340,000 in the special education revolving account. And again, I'll keep you updated. Those are all fluid things. Things come up with special education, as we all know, additional expenditures that we haven't thought about today might pop up in the future. So right now I feel pretty confident that this account is in, is in good condition. Um, so the last piece that I'm going to touch on and then see if you have any additional questions is the grant funding. So Frontier right now is looking at a total of $178,757 in COVID grant funding. Um, some of that is from... You froze, Shelly. She froze at the Waitley meeting. She'll probably fix it. To get one-to-one um, -one devices while Frontier is already one-to-one -one device school, um, we had upgrades that were needed or repairs. So uh, we have that funding available as well as another small amount of funding for PPE. Am I still here? You're all frozen on my end. So I just want to make sure you can hear me. You were frozen there, Shelly, right after when you were probably talking about Chromebooks or something. So okay. you froze about that time. So can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. I go, I go back, Shelly, and just start again at the Municipal Cares Act. Okay. Um, so for the Municipal Cares Act funding, what we did was requested that each of the four towns make a contribution towards Frontiers expenditures. And this was from fiscal year 20, um, based on the cost share allocation by town. So we did that and we have uh, about 19,500 approved in Chromebook or other technology purchases for the one-to-one -one initiative. Um, there was an additional small amount of funding for cleaning and sanitation and PPE. It's a little bit more complicated to pinpoint the exact dollar amount because the town also gets FEMA reimbursement for that. So we actually only get about 25% of that cost that we submitted. But the big ticket item was the technology that we had put in for, for the initial FY20 request. So that's great news that we got $19,500 there from the towns and we're very appreciative of their help. Um, we also have uh, grant funding from the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. That is a DESE grant. We re will receive just over $40,000 for that funding. Uh, Frontier, these funds will be used in a variety of ways, including professional development, technology, and other COVID-related expenses. Additionally, those funds can be used for other Title I grant, things that would be approved under the Title I grant. So it doesn't necessarily have to be COVID-related, um, although we are trying to maintain the focus on that given the additional expenditures. The final uh, grant relief that we have right now is a DESE grant. It's titled Coronavirus Relief Fund. DESE awarded an additional $225 per pupil in our foundation budget. So that would be students who attend from our four towns. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> not, <laughs> not students who are school choice to Frontier. Um, so that gave us an additional $119,000 for um, grant funding for COVID-related, and those are strictly COVID-related unbudgeted expenditures. We only have until December 31st to spend this particular grant. Um, so Sarah and I are in cl close communication with um, George and Scott about the needs, Scott Paul and Scott Dredge about the needs of Frontier. We have a budget mapped out. 
Um, while the funds are not yet fully spent, we do have a plan to spend all of that money already. Um, so on paper of the 178,000, we've spent around 60,000 and have 118 remaining to be spent. And as I said, really do have that mapped out already. Once that is exhausted, um, we have the option to ask the towns if they have any additional FY21 CARES Act funds available that can be allocated for the school. And that would be paid just based on the portion of the town funding. Um, so we're keeping close track of all of our expenses. From there, we would dip into those um, school choice funds that we reserved the 180, I mean, not 180, the $85,000. So a lot of information. Um, happy to take additional questions or clarify anything on that grant funding. Shelly, I just want to say one thing, because um, I know you've still got something else to do. Um, we're going to have public comment coming up. If somebody wants to put in the chat that they want to have a public comment, just put it in the chat. You'll have three minutes. Um, that way, at least you can get it in now. And Scott Dredge will will come on, and, and as he gets them, he'll write them down, and um, – We'll go from there. Go ahead, Shelly. You can finish. I don't have any other financial information um, at this point. Uh, oh, somebody has a question for me in the chat. Bob, is that okay? No, I'm not sure if it's for you. Is it for Shelly? I'm just asking the person who. Uh, Sarah Cole. We'll see. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Said she has a question. That's a really good question. So she put in the chat, why are school choice children not receiving the COVID money? Um, so I guess I should clarify, they will receive the COVID money as far as how we spend it because they're part of our population. But the way that DESE does their um, funding, whether it's for Chapter 70 or a grant, this particular grant is based on foundation enrollment, which is only your students that are within your district. So we get money from the towns that our school choice kids come from, and that's part of our revenue source. However, there has not been any grant funding specifically related to school choice students, but they will benefit from all of the grant funds that we are receiving and spending. You're welcome. Okay, um, so the last piece, uh, which is farther down on the agenda, but Bob has suggested we move it up and I appreciate that. Um, we are hiring a new treasurer. Um, I had sent you all an email. This came up really quickly in the last month and Darius and I jumped on it uh, because we know the importance of this position. Uh, Karen Guy gave her notice to us. We had hired her in December when Paula Light retired. Uh, given the COVID crisis, Karen was put in a position to look at the personal situation with her family and accept a position where she would have more full-time regular employment due to you know, her own circumstances related to COVID. So it's unfortunate that we're losing Karen. She has been a valuable asset and picked up with us really quickly in a short amount of time. Um, and so now we, we posted for a treasurer, uh, reviewed resumes and conducted interviews. And I'm happy to present a candidate to you tonight, um, which is a little bit out of the norm of what we went through in December. But again, we need to move quickly. Karen has agreed to stay on part time in very limited hours to train with um, our new hire. However, uh, we didn't want to come to this meeting, talk about the problem, and then wait another meeting to hire. So hopefully <laughs> we have your forgiveness for not following the proper policy here. Um, but I am happy to present a candidate for you to consider and hopefully hire this evening. Um, so on the call with us is Ina. And Ina, I know you told me how to pronounce your last name. I'm probably not gonna get it right, but I'm going to try. Ina Titensko? Please tell me if I'm... Tisenko. Tisenko. Okay. Um, thank you for that. 
Uh, so I did share out her resume and cover letter with you all. Ina is coming to us with a background in accounting and business administration. Uh, she is a recent graduate of Eisenberg School of Management, graduated with a master's of science in accounting. Um, she has some business background, but primarily her experience has been related to her internship. Um, but she's eager and ready to jump into this role, and I'm confident she's going to be able to follow in Karen's footsteps and pick up where we need her to um, and jump on board. So I'm Ina's happy to take questions. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and Darius and I are looking for your approval to move forward with hiring Ina. Anybody has a question, just chime in. And if, if not, then I'll need a motion. I'll make a motion. Thanks, Olivia. And do I have a second? I'll second. Oh. oh. Is that you, Lynn? Thank you. Um, any other, anybody have any questions now? Okay, I'm uh, I, just, I just want to say I, I did actually, oops, I did review the uh, the cover letter and the resume. Ina, thank you. It was well written and a uh, nice, com well composed letter. Um, I got a sense that you were excited to work in the district and that Shelly and Darius had um, chosen a good candidate to present to us. So thank you. Bill, did you have something? No. No? Okay. Okay, we can do a roll call. Hold on. I got two more. Huh? I'll do I'll call it. Okay, go ahead. Bob Howard. Yes. Keith McFarland. Keith, you out there? I'll skip you for now. Damien. Yes. Thank you. Bill Smith? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Olivia Leone? Yes. Judy Pierce? Yes. Ashley Dion? Yes. Philip Cantor? Yes. Melissa Nova? Yes. Hi, Lynn. How about you? Lynn Roberts? Yes. And Keith and back. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. You all set? Yes, I'm all set. Anna, thank you. Welcome, Ina. Thank you. thank you so much. And um, Ina will start hopefully training with Karen next week. So thank you all for understanding the importance of this and moving ahead with our recommendation. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Time for uh, public comment. I think we... Oh. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Holly, Holly Johnson is up in three minutes. Thank you. Hello, Holly Johnson, co-chair of the district CPAC. Sorry if this is going to be repetitive for the people who are just at the waiting meeting. Um, I have one concern um, that I wanted to add, just mention, and then I have a statement on behalf of the CPAC. Um, so I was under the impression that teachers would not feel forced back into the building and the teachers that were not comfortable could teach the students who chose remote only and not have to be in the building. But now I'm hearing that um, the district has sent something out to teachers that's telling them they're expected to be in the building for five full days unless they take family medical leave. Um, and that just concerns me, you know, on the be behalf of the teachers as, you know, parents, we have a choice. Um, Okay, I'm going to read my CPAC statement now. First, I want to thank you all for putting our concerns on your agenda tonight and for taking the time to discuss the specific needs of special education students. As I'm sure you know from our many emails, we are deeply concerned about special education this fall. As the CPEC has said many times, DESI, DESI issued guidance stating that even if the rest of the school has entered into a hybrid or remote model of instruction, schools and districts must make every effort to maintain in-person instruction for students with disabilities, particularly those with significant and complex needs and preschool students. The guidelines go on to list the six categories that define a student with complex and significant needs. 
One, a student identified as high needs on their IEP, meaning they spend more than 75% of their time outside the general ed classroom. Two, students who cannot engage in remote learning due to their disability. Three, students who use aided communication. Four, homeless students. Five, students in foster care. And six, students identified as English learners. However, we keep hearing that the district is zeroing in on only one of the six categories. SPED Director Karen Ferrandino continues to say that only students in substantially separate placement programs will be prioritized for in-person SPED services this fall. Those students make up a very small percentage of all the SPED students in the district, and it leaves out the other five categories listed as priorities by DESE. CPAC and SPED parents have asked multiple times for clarification, but we keep hearing the same answers. The guidance says all students with disabilities should be prioritized for in-person instruction. All students. Then, among all students with disabilities, schools should pay particular attention to pre-K in the six previously mentioned categories. But this district is not saying that, and parents are justifiably very upset and scared for their children. They are worried that their children with disabilities will not be prioritized because while they may meet DESE's definition of complex and significant needs, they are not identified as high needs and that is what the district is focusing on. Karen has also said that many special education students will not have official IEP meetings before returning this fall. Instead, they will have informal phone calls or emails which leaves parents with no rights or protections. One more paragraph. <laughs> many, many students need changes to their IEPs for compensatory services due to regressions resulting from the inaccessibility of the remote format and to add new IP services to address new areas of need. A family could choose remote instruction but still be interested in in-person services as drop-in or in a community setting or at home. Our survey showed that approximately 40% of our parents wanted drop-in services or in-home community settings. Issues with our special education system are not new. They are only coming to light with the pandemic. DESE has provided guidelines on what should be happening for special education students and our district has decided to pick and choose which sections they will follow, leaving hundreds of students at risk for lifelong inequities. We are asking the school committee to intervene before these children fall through the cracks. Thank you. I'm sorry I went a little over. Carrie Thurlow, you're up three minutes. Hi. Um, my purpose in speaking this evening is to make sure that as a community and as a board of trusted elected officials, that we don't lose sight of the 351 vulnerable students that attend our schools at all levels um, and to ensure that they are educated in the least restrictive environment possible. Our current situation, that means that these students need to have as much face-to-face, in-person instruction as practical and feasible. These boys and girls live with varying degrees of disability, learning barriers, mobility concerns, behavioral challenges, and emotional disorders. They're counting on each of you to make a decision that will affect them for the rest of their lives. Since March, these future voters and community members have lived without meaningful education and services that they need in order to become well-rounded members of their community. They had their measurable progress interrupted by the current pandemic that has forever changed our community. I'm concerned that my boys, along with all of the other high priority students, will continue to get the short end of the stick I'm concerned that I will spend hours advocating for my boys, ever increasing learning needs only to have their state and federally protected rights disregarded, discounted, minim and minimized by those who seek to change the plan that has been agreed to. Presently, our statewide COVID-19 test, positive test results stand at 1.4% which according to all credible sources is the lowest that it's been since testing began. We must stop letting fear rule our lives. We're also told that we had no idea what was going on in so many of our neighboring communities. And with the governor's new map, we really have some reliable information upon which to base our decisions. I'm not proposing that we throw open the doors and open all students into our schools. I'm proposing that we stay the course, that we follow a path of phased reopening, 
in order to allow as many students as possible the opportunity to reconnect, re-engage, and become mem active members of their community again, and that we're able to get down to the business of learning. Thank you. Uh, Max Sherrill, you're up next. Thanks, Gary. Uh, good evening. My name is Max Sherrill. I'm the band and choir director at Frontier. I'm also a resident of South Deerfield. Just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I just want to share a few personal thoughts about what's uh, currently in our plans and how they affect some of the teachers. Uh, first, I understand that over the past several weeks, uh, as well as the entire summer, many important policies have been in process uh, as, in the development. Um, we've, we've seen new, new um, policies and ideas emerge in the last couple of weeks since the first vote took place. Uh, and I really appreciate the work that's been going on by the administrators. Along with them, uh, there have been a number of teachers who have been volunteering their time on these committees um, many, many hours. Um, and uh, it's very valuable that their voices are heard. Um, and I, I also wanted to thank them as well. I wanted to continue to just make a call for um, treating each other, everyone who's in this process together with civility and respect. Um, in particular, the teachers have been asked to point out gaps in the plans. And um, I just want to make sure that we understand that we're doing our due diligence in doing that. We're not trying to um, stand in the way of, of reopening the school. Um, and so I, I just want to point out that um, there, there is one particular gap that I'd like to, to raise. Um, there, are, there are many as at this current point, but one in particular is the, the approach um, with regards to the high school schedule. I realize this is a building level issue. It's being looked at by the administration, but over the course of the summer and the last several weeks, it hasn't appeared to, there hasn't been, appeared to have been a change in this approach. Um, and I'm concerned from a safety standpoint. Um, most schools that are pursuing a hybrid model are looking at pods uh, for roughly 10 students that stay together throughout the school day. Um, and that really reduces the ex potential exposure. Um, right now, to my knowledge, this may change, um, but our high school model for hybrid uh, involves half the student population coming in, perhaps less depending on the number of students that choose from, uh, the hybrid, um, but then rotating through their classes more or less as normal, which means that they will be uh, in classes with other students every period of the day. That means that the exposure, um, depending on how you define that, uh, could be much more than a pot of 10. It could be upwards of 150 or 200 students in a given day, uh, not to mention the contact that teachers have with those. Um, there, there are some solutions out there. Um, I, I, I simply want to raise this as a, as a major concern, a major gap in the plan. And I, I do hope that um, this particular item, uh, we can change course on this and try to come, with, come up with a safer hybrid approach. Um, I also would once again advocate for delay to the start of in-person instruction. Um, and if that is something that will happen, uh, a delay, I would also ask that we consider, or you consider, the school committee and the administration, determining a timeline for when we need to have the plans in place. Because I do think there's, as we get closer to the start of the school year, tensions rise among the faculty and staff, understandably, especially with uncertainty. And if we had an understanding that two or three weeks out from the start of in-person instruction, we needed to have a plan that was firmly in place, I think that would help. So that's all I would ask. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Erica, you're up next. Hi. Um, I just briefly wanted to say that um, I've been talking with a lot of people, and I think there's been some, um, I've certainly been in touch with the administration and the school committee. Um, I am feeling I'm, my thoughts on this are evolving as I hear from everybody and I work on all these different, um, with all these different populations, but as the child of public school teachers um, and as an advocate for public school, my feeling is always trust the teachers, listen to the teachers. That doesn't mean that I don't think that we need to um, look at everybody's needs. And in fact, my, my focus is that highest need kids should be getting the highest level of in-person instruction in any kind of 
hybrid or remote plus or whatever it's called. That's not the important point. But I think the important point is this idea of pods. I um, have a kid in high school and I've talked to several of the kids in high school that I see um, socially distancedly recently and they all talk about how they feel like the halls of Frontier are not going to be patrollable, that kids are gonna pull off their masks and think it's funny, that there's gonna be a lot going on in the halls that are not going to be able to be controlled. And it scares them a lot. And they're telling me that they're really scared. And they're also telling me that they are scared to not go to school because there's a lot of social pressure. So I think there's just a real feeling of division within the kids that I'm hearing from right now as a therapist too, from my clients. And what I wanted to say was that if there were a more clear plan and that included a delay a little bit of going back into the classrooms until we understand what this pod system is. And I would say right up front from what I heard from Holly and Carrie, I think that kids with high needs should be being prioritized and that should be a pod system right away and then that as we can develop a phased in, that all kids should be in a pod of 10 and the teachers should be working in that kind of modality, even in high school, because they, they can the spread is gonna happen just as much as it is in the younger schools and in the younger schools, they're already naturally potted. So I just wanted to really put in that plug and say that I love these kids and they are really scared. And I think that they'll be a lot less scared if if there's a clear sense of what this is going to look like and how they will be kept safe. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley Dennis, you're up. Thank you. Um, thank you all the members of the committee, um, the administration, to all of our staff and faculty members who have been working so hard to develop all these plans. I myself, I'm one of the school nurses at Frontier. I'm on many of these committees. Um, Max, like you said, we've all been volunteering our time to help plan and coordinate and um, everybody's been working so hard. And um, as Erica Ross just said, um, I just, I really agree with what was just expressed that the idea of small pods would really be a, a really helpful idea for people's sense of comfort and therefore ability to learn. I think that one of the highest reasons for us return, for returning to in-person learning is for the social emotional aspects, the benefits to our students. Um, but they, I feel cannot appreciate, cannot gain from that in-person time when they are feeling fearful, scared of health and safety that um, in a setting that feels rather uncontrollable. The idea of hallways and passing time is such I mean, that's like when the herd is moving. That's just, that's kind of uncontrollable time. Um, and the idea that we can really keep people in an orderly fashion and maintaining social distancing in that is worrisome to me. I also very much agree that our high needs populations really, really need to be and will be appropriately prioritized for, for in-person services. And that's critical. Um, that said, the greater safety we can provide for in the the other in the rest in the general population of students that will provide for greater safety as well for our high needs populations so i just want us to be really careful i urge you please to be really careful in the planning um the idea of students moving room to room in different groups is is a, a big concern and having them feel safe securing proper you know and appropriately planned and cared for their safety and health is critical to the benefits of being in person. Thank you everyone for all the work you're doing. I much appreciate it. Thanks, Ashley. It looks like it's it for public comment, Bob. Thank you, Scott. Yep. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna close public comment now and um, we're gonna go into the, our new business. Um, Darius, you wanna start off with the update? So I guess, Bob, you know, I wonder if you should move number seven up, um, you know, the discussion of the possible revote. If we're going to, if you're changing to a remote model this evening, I'm not going to talk about the hybrid model for an hour and a half. Okay. 
<clears throat> so if if somebody wants to do a a, a revote, so somebody had voted yes for the hybrid would have to make the motion to change the vote. And I know we've had one school committee meeting in Sunderland where it was voted three to two, that was a hybrid, and they re-voted it. And it wasn't somebody that voted yes to do it, but it was just brought up and it was ended up being four to one. So one of the no's changed to a yes. So if we have anybody in the that voted yes that wants to have a re-vote, they're the ones that would have to bring it up, not the persons that voted no for the hybrid. But also, Darius, if you want to just chime in what we talked about earlier today and what you brought up to Waitley tonight, you know, I mean. Well, I mean, I'll give, I mean, I'll give an update of where we are in our planning, Bob, but I, I just think okay. it's the, I mean, I guess you can, you can put it later on the agenda. I just didn't know if that's the, it makes sense to, in my mind, it made sense if we we're going to be talking about the changing models before going diving yeah. deeper into the first model that we kind of get that squared away. But it's your meeting to your meeting to decide how you want to do it. Well, can I just can I just say so earlier today that Darius brought it to my attention that the first two weeks of school are going to be remote. And he brought it up to Waitley tonight, presented in Waitley. So the first two weeks are going to be remote. Um, the high needs kids will be attended to immediately. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the date is for them, but. The first 10 days will be professional development, followed by two, two weeks of remote for the, we'll say the, our, our normal kids, okay? So the, the high needs kids will have to, um, if I said something wrong, I apologize. Um, Bob, I can, I can give you my, I can give the report if you want. <laughs> I was only just trying I to, uh, I, was only, I, don't, I won't try I'm to see your agenda. I'm a full advocate for, for everybody so bob can i chime in yes keith so i introduced that in an email after the last meeting i introduced that agenda item and after sunderland meeting i got all the answers that i would need so i would basically withdraw that item i mean i introduced that i'd withdraw if there's anybody else who voted yes i would like to bring it up you know i, I would I'm not going to stop that but that was that was my agenda item and i'm going to withdraw it and one of the one of the things Keith was bringing up to ask him was about if somebody does do remote, will it be something else that's going to teach our kids? And talking to George, um, George, you can chime in if you like, so I don't put my foot in my mouth again. Um, and George was saying that uh, the kids, kids that are in remote, we taught by frontier teachers. Are you there, George? Are you with me? I I'm, with you, Bob. I'm with you, Bob. Can you <laughs> see me? I'm here. So no, I'm because no. It seems I know, I, and I know that this is something that's going to be addressed. I believe later on in the agenda when they're talking about uh, the plans for the hybrid model. But but no, I, one of the misconceptions, uh, and I I know I had reached out to you, and you asked, you had asked to share it with some of the school committee members. Uh, one of the misconceptions that we wanted to clear up was uh, there was a there was a notion that um, if students were choosing the remote option that it was going to be completely offloaded um, to uh, either Edgenuity or VHS. There was a concern as to whether or not they're going to have frontier teachers. Um, and I was just reaffirming to you that Edgenuity is basically a supplemental program. It's there to it's there, it's there to supplement. It is not there to supplant. Um, it's there to, to 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 help our teachers uh, to provide them uh, material if they need it, but but um, and, and like I said, um, we're going to be talking more about this later. But just uh, just to reassure people that if they choose remote, they're they're not getting they're not getting an online system. They're going to actually have frontier teachers. Thank you, George. You're welcome. So, if it, so, so, so I mean, just I I was pretty comfortable with with that agenda item right where it was. Just just or, or just just because I was looking forward to. I mean, I, I'm one of those that voted yes to the hybrid, and I was looking forward to being made feel to feel better about my vote. Um, uh, you know, so so you know, I, I was wondering what took place. But you know, when when we left the meeting last time, it was um, with a sense that there were going to be changes made and uh, concerns addressed and all that. And I, I I wanted to hear about that, and I wanted to hear the questions that people that that 
that the public pe uh, speakers, that the people that addressed us during public comment, those concerns about hallway and whatnot. I mean, I, I, before we go to vote on where before before we contemplate whether we want to revote that or not. So that's just my take on it. Thank you. And, you know, I should have shared what George sent me. I shared it with Keith because Keith had a concern about something. I just wanted to reassure Keith about that frontier teachers will be teaching remote unless there's some caster spot, something out there that couldn't be done. So, um, so if there's no one that's got someone smiling at me, so I, I, I guess, um, but if, if no one wants to change the vote who voted yes, then we're just going to continue on with the agenda tonight. Darius, why don't you uh, continue, then? Great. All right, so I guess you're looking at uh, the latest, uh, the update of uh, the community data metrics um, for the uh, COVID safe school model. Um, so basically, Meg, are you on? <clears throat> Meg yep. Birch was here, our nurse leader. Uh, us. So Meg has worked um, extensively on this, um, developing these matrix. As you may know, the state has also released its matrix for, for school reopening, and we kind of have a blended model that Meg's going to, um, is going to present. So I'm going to present my, uh, my screen here. Yikes. So the state did come out with, um, with their, uh, metrics, um, the long awaited metrics last Tuesday, um, they refined how they present them on the map a little bit today, but, um, and I'll get to that. I just, I like to start with um, the sort of key components of everything that we're all doing um, in this pandemic in terms of health and safety that really, you know, I, I think of foundation and its masks and its physical distancing and its hand hygiene and it's staying home if you're unwell. So I am taking advantage of opportunities to put that up out there and up there whenever I can. So that's that. my little plug. Um, so as as we you know we we've talked about the metrics other times. Um, there are a lot. There's a lot of data out there. Um, not everything is you know comparable in terms of how the information is calculated. And so. Um, we talked about other metrics, you know, earlier versions of the metrics, and we continue to revise them as more data um, are available and as the state has come out with their guidance. So I wanted to sort of um, just identify quickly and clearly what are the data sources we're going to be um, using and working with our local board of health um, to be monitoring um, the ongoing situation. So there's the weekly data report from um, uh, DPH that um, comes out on Wednesdays. Uh, there's the daily uh, information that comes out and um, specifically um, in, in that report is the percent positivity. Um, and the New York Times has, uh, you know, I know many people have seen this and talked about it, the interactive map where you can get um, case counts um, by, by county level. Those tend to be pretty much updated um, data, um, and it's the county level is what we're um, particularly interested in. And then the Harvard Global Health Institute um, has their interactive dashboard, and again, we can get county level data um, that's presented different, the data are different than what is in the New York Times um, data source. So that's what we're kind of working with for our metrics. This is a overview of the command center DESI color-coded um, metrics. Um, they are using a 14-day rolling average um, of cases um, and when they present their map, which is available on their dashboard site, um, they're, they're coloring um, each town uh, with the, these numbers are um, average daily cases per 100,000. So they're marking any community as red when that's greater than eight, yellow between four and eight, less than four is green, and then unshaded is when there's fewer than five total cases over the last 14 days. So it's a little, it's a little deceptive to have unshaded, to have that 
category in comparison to the others because you're actually not comparing the same data points. Uh, and, the, and the unshaded is an attempt to provide um, guidance for small communities with small populations in very few cases. Um, so that's the data. And then this is sort of how they interpret it. Um, and their, their interpretation is if it's over, um, and this is, we've incorporated in our metrics, which I'll get to, over eight cases per 100,000 would, would indicate remote. Um, four to eight, they say hybrid or remote, um, if there are extenuating circumstances. And then less than four per 100,000, they are suggesting full person or hybrid. And again, extenuating circumstances, which the best I've heard from them in terms of a definition is that those extenuating circumstances, you know, really that's a, that's a question that sort of kicked back to the local level and regional uh, local board of health to, to look at what else is going on in a community. Um, I really see, um, I, I didn't, I really see, you know, for us, it's we're we really are only talking about hybrid or remote that the full in person isn't, um, sort of part of the conversation right now, but it's there because that's part of their presentation. So I tried to um, think about our data um, and the, the um, data points that we were looking at um, by levels. So primary indicators would be triggers, uh, would be data that would trigger um, a 14 day closure. Um, and that would be statewide or regional data based on very large numbers. Secondary indicators would trigger um, a shorter term closure to allow a further assessment by the local board of health um, and in collaboration with the school district. Those would be based on regional or local um, data. And then um, tertiary would be um, data that basically triggered us um, to say, we got to talk. We're, you know, we're seeing something um, and we, we want to have a conversation and figure out um, if this is going to change what we're doing. Um, so that would be, a, it would be just sort of a way to, to flag before we got to um, where we, we met one of the diff other end indicators. So the primary indicators, um, we would be looking at that average daily cases um, staying under eight per 100,000. Um, and the state, the, the uh, percent positivity um, staying below 5%, that's the number we get from the daily dashboard. Um, right now it's at 1.4, which is the lowest observed, I think, I think they're calling it the lowest observed value now. Um, and then we're still waiting for a regional indicator from um, the Department of Public Health and DESE. Um, it is promised, we have not seen it. Um, and I am working with um, others to advocate for them to come out with both um, district-wide and uh, county-wide um, for us um, and for, or for them to provide the raw data um, that we can then find somebody locally to do the calculations that we need. So the secondary indicators, these are, these are um, sort of variations of what we had been working with before, um, but we're looking at the confirmed COVID cases over the last 14 days for the county um, staying below 25, and that would exclude congregate settings um, such as a skilled nursing facility or correctional facility. Um, it would not exclude um, something happening in another school. Um, it's really a, a congregate setting that's that's where you're not going to have as met people really uh, going between where they are in the and the community. Um, I still am sticking with the percent positive below 3% for Franklin County um, using the data that are available. We would have to calculate that for the 26 Franklin County towns. 5% um, just seems too high for our area. And then um, looking to calculate Franklin Hampshire County combined data that um, it's 10, the, less than 10 cases per day or 70 cases um, over the week. And those would be uh, weighted, um, adjusted 100, per 100,000 population. Sorry, it's been a long day. 
Um, and the weights we would be using the um, county specific data from the New York Times for Massachusetts. Um, so, and then the last category of data would be, we would be looking at trends and watching those closely. Um, you know, something can happen in one day um, that um, may seem like, you know, uh, I, I mean, is alarming. It just doesn't seem alarming, but, um, but can be alarming, but without having it sort of in the context of what's been happening. Um, if the data are generally uh, staying level, um, you know, or have been decreasing, it, it may be we sort of watch that. Um, if the data are starting to trend upwards, even if we haven't reached the one of the thresholds of the, the primary or the secondary indicators, um, it would be a flag to, to look more closely at what was happening, see if we could find additional data, um, talk to others in, um, you know, the Board of Health. Uh, we we would will be monitoring data internally. Um, again, the dismissals. If we're dismissing kids with the same presentation, um, 1.9 percent of a building census, the expected number of uh, students and staff in a building, um, or absence is greater than 10 percent of who we expect to be there. Um, the 1.9 I had uh, noted on a previous document. That's um. That's using the baseline for influenza-like illness for the uh, for New England, um, and I know that there will be a baseline for COVID-like illness, but I couldn't find it yet. Um, and um, and then the last thing is really, you know, us in collaboration with the local boards of health. If they're if they're rep if we get a report from our local board of health that they're starting to get some more positives in one of our four towns or if we start hearing that from others in um, Franklin County that's that's going to cause us to sort of pause and look at what's happening and try and get additional data so we can make an appropriate decision. So the closure scenarios I think there um, in previous meetings there were some questions around this and I wanted to try and clarify um, what what the, what our thinking has been, and um, this captures some of my conversations with local board of health um, folks. So, you know, a long term closure would be greater than 14 days, and that would really be there's widespread transmission in the community, um, and you know the primary indicators that we're using are remaining above the threshold with no leveling or decrease um, in trend. Um, a 14-day district or um, school-specific building closure. Um, again, there would be indicators of community spread and the potential for, for um, school transmission. Um, we would only open after a 14-day, we would only look to open after a closure like that if the primary indicators had gone down um, below threshold. Um, and again, you know, there's lots of data we're going to be looking at. So um, some of these are are fluid by just definition. Um, and then lastly, the short term, one to three or three to five days, um, that's really to allow um, a full assessment of the data. So that's a pause. That's a sort of saying, what's going on? We think there, you know, is this is this school based transmission? Is it community transmission? Is this a blip? Um, that's all related to, you know, to one event um, where people made different decisions. Um, and so then the next step to whether we reopen or remain closed would be determined by the local board of health in collaboration with the district. Um, and anytime there's a short term closure that can be extended to a 14 day or an even longer closure if the data indicate that that's the appropriate and safe um, thing to do. That's it. Thanks, Meg. I know uh, Damien had a question. Yep. All right. Uh, you got me? Yes, yep. sir. Uh, yeah, actually, Meg, I, I think you pretty much answered my question. I, I got maybe a little trigger happy there, but I was looking, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was looking earlier today on the uh, <clears throat> protocol for a potential closure, and it looked like the document hadn't changed from when Darius presented it a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> maybe my had not um, uh, refreshed. So I was just, my question was going to be, was, was that document going to mimic 
um, the new state guidelines. And it looks like that it did and you presented on it. So thank you. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it will. Quite honestly, Damien, um, it's on my list to get it back into that document and, and update all of the um, the changes that we've made. And I um, I haven't gotten that gotten there. So thank you for um, it's a reminder. Yeah, <laughs> it's thank a you. reminder. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for uh, Meg? Thanks for the presentation, Meg. I have a question. Are, <laughs> Missy? Uh, yes. Meg, did you find out how how quickly you're able to get information from the testing centers for delays oh. in testing? Yeah, so that was um, – the, the, yeah, you probably noticed that I had to take that metric out of our tertiary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, I was in the meeting last Thursday with, um, it was a presentation um, that included folks, uh, medical director from Bay State Franklin, Community Health Center, um, information from Cooley Dickinson was presented, Valley Medical Group was there. And um, they they provided an update on their testing um, capacity and their current turnaround time, which was actually all forty under forty eight hours, including the community health center because they've renegotiated um, with Quest for all community health center data to kind of jump to the front of the line or uh, samples for testing um, to jump to the front of the line. But um, the the sort of the the, an the gentle answer was to have them give us regular updates um, was kind of a pipe dream. Um, you know, I, th I think we'll still be able to get a little bit of a bead on it, but I didn't want to rely on it for our decision making purposes since we really couldn't count on getting that data. Um, I think it is important data. The state thinks it's important data, um, but they're not providing it to communities. And so you know, that's that's one of the things that's been frustrating in this process is they can sort of write what we need to do and the data we need to have, but they're not providing it. Yeah, so we're trying we're trying to, you know, we're you know, I feel I feel really good about what we've put together. I feel like um, I feel like we can get the data that we're looking at at this point. And I have a, another random question that you may or may not know the answer to. You know what happened on July 30th? There are like 300, uh, 100 cases that fell off the dashboard. Oh, I. You know what? I read about that. It. Um, it was a reclassification of something. It was a. It was a data cleanup. Was what it was. Um, I, I did read about that in the last 24 or 48 hours, Missy, and um, that's as far as, that's all my brain kept. <laughs> it's okay, there's a lot to store in little pockets, so thank you. I just thought you might have some insight that I didn't see anywhere. Nope, it was, yeah. Thanks, anybody right. else have any more questions for Meg? Okay. Um, Next, we're going to do. Does somebody have a question? No. Uh, planning and scheduling. So yeah, so the, the I think the big update, and I'm going to have Sarah Mitchell and maybe even um, either George or Scott talking about this as well tonight, is that we we rolled into this week um, with our long list of tasks, you know, including um, you know basically you know negotiating with the teaching staff, um, trying to reach the accommodations necessary of the teaching staff. Um, and rescheduling and that kind of sort that I'm really concerned about the timeline that I created. I mean, some of it was created by someone else, but I'll take the responsibility of the timeline to the rollout that um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, um, I'm not confident that would be um, in their best interest to try to roll out without starting in a, I'd like to start in a remote setting um, for two weeks and then roll into our hybrid thing. Um, I just, there's so many moving parts um, and I'm talking about the cross the district, it's not just that frontier, Maybe it was just frontier. We could, you know, kind of, uh, kind of beef up and get it get it implemented in time. But looking at the elementaries and all the moving parts of their of our district, um, that I really want to uh, 
to start the year off with a two weeks of remote and then go into our hybrid plan. Um, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit? We So this is basically, this is kind of hot off the press. This is when we're talking about like we're actively planning. Yesterday morning, uh, we had a, an admin meeting and I was concerned, brought it up, that I was concerned about the rollout and the timing which we're at. I'm also seeing, you know, Scott had a, Greg had a full head of hair and he didn't all of a sudden. Um, but no, just, I mean, you know, try, trying to keep it light, but it was serious in the sense that, you know, they're just people we've working and working to the bone and um, I just want to make sure that everything is the way it's supposed to be when we start bringing students in the building. Um, and I think that, uh, so that's that's kind of the general wall out there. So I'm looking to, it's not really a vote. You kind of gave me the discretion to, you can take back that discretion at any time, but I said I wanted to roll it out slower and now I'm rolling out even slower. Um, and one of the other kind of uh, data points in that was that um, I got contacted by the local board of health. They were concerned about the fallout from Labor Day weekend. If we're going to follow the patterns of other weekends, which was the 4th of July, that really we would be opening up in prime time within four days of a Labor Day weekend, that that would be also, you know, they asked if I could push it a couple days. So now, um, you know, you obviously respect their, their, their thoughts on that. And so I was like, well, if I push that, you know, um, you know, maybe I should just push this two weeks and then so that we can open up, um, and get all these loose ends put together. We also have, you know, staff members have asked for accommodations. Um, kind of rolling that out. It's a longer process. And I don't have a full HR department. It's uh, Donna, myself, and Shelly going through those paperwork, contacting attorneys to make sure that we make sure everybody's rights are met and that we don't put the school in a legal bind. Um, so, um, and you know, just the general other odds and ends around the building to make sure that we're up to snuff from HVAC to signage to um, I know we got our tents are moving faster now, but I was concerned about the tents earlier on this week. Um, so, you know, in general, that's kind of the general overview why we're there. Um, Sarah or George, do you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, Darius, I don't know whether you want to share your screen with that calendar on it, um, if you have that up and ready. Mm -hmm. But I can kind of take you through uh, what it looks like for the first couple of months now if we put in this um, couple of weeks of remote learning. So it would start out um, the way we had originally planned, which is uh, the 10 days of professional development for uh, teachers, which would bring us up through September 9th. We also have a pretty chock full schedule for those 10 days um, with a focus on remote learning since our hybrid model has a lot of remote learning embedded in it. We wanna make sure that we have a clear focus on that. Um, we still are working out some of the details about how we would get materials to students because if we're going to start out remote, we want to make sure that our students are prepared to um, start classes right away on that September 10th. Um, so we would move, be moving and um, doing our remote first remote learning day on September 10th. So every student in the building would be remote. We'd start out with an orientation, um, some connections. September 11th would also be a remote learning for all students. And then the week of the 14th, we're looking at remote learning um, continuing on um, for the majority of our students, but bringing in our special populations, our high need um, students on that September 14th date um, and have them attend on that Monday, Thursday, I'm sorry, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday schedule um, with that Wednesday being the, the break in the week with all remote again. Moving on to the week of the 21st, um, we would still be in that same pattern with our special populations, our high need populations coming into the building for those two days. And then we would start with um, the remainder of our students coming in. So we've slowed it down again. So we um, are back to that original conversation that we had about bringing students in uh, one day a week. So we're in the process right now of dividing our uh, high school cohorts up by alphabet. And so we've divided them into four separate groups, uh, cohort A, B, C, and D. And as you can see, they would be coming in sequentially on those four days. We've broken up our middle school teams a little bit differently for those opening days. We would have our seventh grade team coming in for an orientation in person half day, these would all be four half days. So we would kind of start full days and then have four half days. This allows us to get students in the building and doing a, a more thorough health and safety conversation with them. 
and kind of a, a bit of a repeat in some of those orientation activities because now they're actually going to be in the building. So teaching them how to come in and out of the building. And by having those four days as a half day, we do two things. One, we avoid having to launch right into lunches. Um, so we avoid the lunch situation for four days and give students just a chance to get in and meet teachers. We also provide an opportunity in the afternoon for teacher collaboration to really work out the kinks, what went well, what didn't go well, how are we gonna modify it for tomorrow for the next group, um, some additional teacher collaboration times and some professional development pieces. And one Wednesday we go to um, remote learning again. We do have a middle school team that will be meeting on Wednesdays. We really wanted to try to spread out the number of students in the building. Um, and then October 1st is when we go into full days and we continue that pattern up through October 8th. And then we look to the metrics and the data in our community to see if we're gonna stay in that one day a week model or whether we're going to go fully remote because things aren't going well or whether we are going to go uh, to two days a week uh, for students coming into the building. And so I've got it written down here as a cohort A and a cohort B split uh, with the teams coming in fully on those days. Uh, so if you scroll down, uh, Darius, you can kind of see that starting on where the, the color changes purple to the 15th. And then we would continue on again and watching those health metrics to see where we go from there. So in this plan, um, our special, our high need special populations are going to be coming in um, right from the get go. But if we scroll back up to the top, we are actually gonna bring in our students that um, have IB, IEPs that are a little less significant. We're gonna start bringing them in an additional day um, when all students return to the building. And then we're, because we're only bringing the um, general population in for one day a week during those initial weeks, uh, we'll start with a, one additional day, but we're quickly gonna ramp that up to two additional days because we feel like three days is really the minimum we want to go with students that have um, individual education plans, um, even if they're not in that high needs um, population. But that's it for that calendar. Are we going to look at another calendar, Sarah, or is that it for the present? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> there I'm, was, just, there... I'm just waiting. So I, if that, I, I have a question. Yes, so go I've ahead. Heard, there... I heard it from Max tonight, and I heard it for the last couple of weeks, and I, I think I know the answer. But why can't 10 kids, we'll say 10 kids, stay in a pod and just go to different classes, you know, but I know the answer, like, isn't there some 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders that take some of the same classes, correct? Yeah, so we looked at initially, um, we looked at a lot of different models. Um, so um, we had developed about, like Northampton did, only we didn't bring it to you over and over again because it would have been um, incredibly tedious and constantly changing. We we had a number of different models and one of the models that we had was actually running uh, one block for the entire week and this is when we were looking at some of the in-person options and leaving students in a particular pod it's we can't run the high school with students going to their classes in pods at like we can for the middle school so the middle school students take english math science and social studies they all take the same classes and then they take an exploratory so it's very easy to create those groups and leave them together. At the high school, every student has a different schedule. You might have a few students with the same schedule and we started to look at that and what would it mean to reschedule all those students? What would it mean to just offer our basic courses? And we felt that it would really sacri sacrifice the educational program that we offer at Frontier. We really value the choices that students have. Um, and so then we started to look creatively at the schedule itself. So if we wanted to keep all of our choices, how could we, what levels would we have um, in creating those options? So we looked at possibly running a block for an entire week. 
And so students would stay in their A block class, they would have some lessons in that class, but then the rest of their day would be remote. Um, and some of those options, they just never got off the ground. We brought them to our department chairs and our faculty, um, and they really felt they didn't want to be sitting there monitoring students all day um, in that setting. Um, so that's why those ideas kind of died in committee. Now, we're a lot further along now in the summer, and I understand people kind of considering those other options again. Um, but again, I go back to kind of the, the conversations we're having about uh, what does a frontier education look like? Um, and so that's how we got to today, where we're, we're looking at creating cohorts in the high school. And so, yes, you do have a, a larger population of students that are in that cohort. Um, you've got about 75 to 80 students um, in the high school. And that's where we're at. Thanks for answering my question. Sure. Uh, Damien, I think you had a question, correct? Control D. Yeah, okay, got it, <laughs> got it. Um, yeah, my question, um, and, and actually what I'm advocating for as well, but also not, I, I, I'm, I'm respectful of it for some of the needs of the teachers. Um, the beginning of the school year when we're all remote, um, are the majority of the teachers that at least don't have, you know, underlying health concerns, they're healthy, they can report to work, are they going to be expected to report to the classroom to teach, or are they going to be teaching from home? And I'm advocating that, you know, if they can go to work, we should go to work. So that's that's on the negotiating table right now. I'm meeting with the Frontiers uh, Teacher Association. I had to meet with them today, um, and so I can give you up to date on that and executive. But because it's being negotiated, it shouldn't be discussed in public. So um, that is one of the things we're talking about. You know, when when should teachers need to be in the building, um, and the pros and cons of of doing that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and there was. Is anybody else have any? oh, Sorry, go ahead, Sarah. I was just going to circle back to a question that was raised earlier, which was about, um, and George spoke to it also about the remote only and the remote, and kind of just give you a quick history of that also. So originally, we had looked at kind of teasing out that remote only population and trying to create a separate um, kind of cohort for them or separate set of teachers and um, using some ingenuity software and some VHS software. Um, and the reality was that uh, there were a lot of faculty that wanted to have those remote only students in their room. The proportion of teachers that were um, choosing or wanting to um, be on medical and be teaching remote only didn't really match up with the proportion of students we had that were remote only. Um, and so the bottom line is that, and the, the key point, um, we had, uh, Scott Paul has done a lot of research, um, and not only research, but purchasing of technology that's really going to help teachers teach their whole class as one class, uh, whether they are at home or whether they are in the classroom. So he's purchased webcams, um, speakers, um, some interactive technology so that uh, teachers would have some kind of a dual monitor so they could see the, their remote students and their live students um, at the same time. And so with that technology, it really kind of opens the door to being able to teach an entire class, um, even though half of them are at home. So that was really kind of the key tipping points. So the bottom line for families is that um, students will be enrolled in classes, whether they're at home doing remote only or whether they're hybrid. Uh, they'll be in the same classes. They'll have the same schedule that they originally were intending to have. Missy had a question, I think, for you, Sarah, also. Actually, I don't know if this is specific for you, Sarah, but uh, what's the status of outdoor space and tents? I don't know if this is coming later or... Yeah, so we, um, we've, I've been talking about tents since uh, March. <laughs> um, and um, with the help of um, a community member who I actually, I saw her on a little bit earlier, 
Um, we've been able to rent um, a number of tents, and then we're also going to purchase a few tents because um, having some tents long term. So we have a number of faculty that have requested tents, and we're going to be able to accommodate all of them. We're working on what the technology solution for that is, um, getting wireless out there. Some of the tents are going to be really easy because they're close enough to the building that we're going to be able to put um, um, a hotspot in the window and it will shoot out and we'll have the technology we need. Um, because, you know, when you're talking about teaching two groups of learners now, now you really do need your, your technology. So, yeah, so we've, we've got a, a lot of tents coming. We're going to use them for all sorts of things, um, everything from mass breaks, um, because we really want to try to have those mass breaks outdoors. So if it's raining out, now all of a sudden we have a spot that we can do those. Um, and then also outdoor classes and eating too. So we'll have one uh, 60 by 18 tent that will be right outside the cafeteria. And I envision that staying up all year. I mean, it's uh, it's meant for uh, barns and outdoor um, you know, uses. So I can imagine, I, I think it will take a snow load even. Um, so we'll see how that works out, but it might be a little chilly eating out there in the snow, but. Really fast. Yeah. Put the wool socks on, right? Does anybody else have any questions right this minute? If that's it with, with that, um, the CPAC concerns and questions, who's going to take care of that? Is that you, Sarah, or, or Darius, or Karen? I'm actually going to ask Karen to jump on. Karen. Hi. Hi. Hi to you though, I just saw recently. I, I do want to address it and I, I do want to just say I understand that communication, there's a lot of information coming uh, and I know some of you were just in the Waitley meeting and I, I just realized that I had just heard that letter and those concerns for the first time. Um, they weren't shared with me after the Sunderland meeting so it took me a little time to sort of digest. And I think one of the things, um, as far as the concern of our focus just being on substantial students in substantially separate programs and only focusing on that category, I just want to say this district has a commitment to students with special needs that increases every year. And um, the amount of work Frontier has done to increase its inclusive opportunities and to keep its high need students in the school and to include them um, in all aspects of the school has just been amazing over the years and the improvement in that. And I think where the complication happened was in the Sunderland meeting, uh, if I may say, which was the first meeting I kind of talked about this, is I was trying to say how we would highlight our high needs kids. And I was kind of trying to say the opposite. I was saying our most districts are focusing on kids with substantially separate programming as a placement page, which means you're out of the general ed more than 60% of the time. But in Sunderland and in Frontier and all our schools, our high needs kids aren't actually out of the general ed environment 60% of the time. So what I was trying to say and kind of said was we can guarantee that our CAS students, any student in Sunderland that was seen um, as one of our high needs students or intensive needs would be guaranteed uh, to be increased in person. And so I just want to give uh, the CPAC and Holly and everybody's concern uh, just a straight out, it is bigger than that. Uh, we have been in communication with what we call our ALPS program. We've been in communication with our FTEP program. We have uh, students that we consider high needs that don't even have a program name. Uh, we see them as intensive. They're in the general ed uh, 60, 80% of the time and pulled out for others. We know who those students are and they are not in a substantially separate program. And we have been focusing on these students and how we're going to work with them to be included um, in an in a increased amount of time for in-person. Um, so I want to clar clarify that confusion. I never meant that we were only focusing on substantially separate. Uh, it was the first time I was speaking and I, I think I was highlighting uh, sort of how placement falls into that and how other districts were only focusing on their substantially separate placements. So we have a number of kids that we have identified for increased in person and working with those teachers uh, to identify what that model would look like and taking into their needs for accommodations and our staffing. We're also well aware of homeless and ELL and foster care students and have been re reaching out to those parents. Uh, we are in constant communication. Um, our 
educational team leader, Carolyn Eddy, uh, the faculty that are available, uh, the number of emails and communications with parents and faculty um, is incredible. Uh, and uh, most of the parents we're communicating with are aware that it's hard to give the exact model at this time, as we just identified the hybrid model and we're working uh, at many, many different levels to figure out all the different pieces. But the commitment to increase in-person in FTEP and ALPS and all our high needs kids, whether they're in a substantially separate programming or not. One of the things that we're going to do after we acknowledge that is when our faculty return, they will be in contacting all families on IEPs and we'll be talking to them about how the experience was in the spring and any concerns to be able to address those concerns. Um, and I think one of the things that was expressed was not having IEP meetings until the fall. Follow me here because this is tricky is the change in delivery service of the hows and whens of a hybrid or a remote as per DESI, it, it doesn't warrant an IEP change. So you play back to parents in either a narrative or a different firm format, this is what your IEP services look like. So they can be, uh, it could be remote, remote or it can be in person without increased amount of time, or we could be increasing their amount of time and we will mail that out or email those out to parents of what it looks like once we have time to get in for our planning, contact parents and send it all back out. I hope that made sense. For parents, when we call them up and they say, oh my gosh, my parent, child has needs have changed, their anxiety is higher, they have social emotional issues, something in their IEP has to change. The child's needs change, that's an IEP issue. How we deliver the services differently it gets sent out into different formats. So we'll be both having IEP meetings and reaching out to parents uh, to inform them of how and when the IEP services will be delivered in our hybrid and in-person services. So I just wanna clarify, please, we are not only uh, increasing, as you can see from Sarah's model, uh, there's a high focus on vulnerable students, a high focus and prioritizing our high need students. And they are not just students that are normally out of the general ed environment for 75% of the time. It's much more than that. I just saw in the chat somebody say, may I ask a question? So uh, that was sort of my intro. If you have specific questions, please ask me. I'm much better at dialogue than just uh, um, uh, kind of leading the conversation to the boxes on my screen. Yeah, Judy has a question for you. Yeah. I, I, th I think it's an easy one. Um, so you talked about um, I, I, bet I definitely um, understand how you plan to support all of the different students, not just to focus on the substantially um, um, separate Sep students. Um, is there also um, an awareness of um, students that would could, could come into an IEP model when the fall semester starts that could have um, had changing needs that would require sort of uh, a change to their in-person services or an IP structure and support. Um, and all that continues to be available to people in the same way that it always has been by coordinating with the principal and meeting with all the appropriate people and doing all the things. Absolutely, we'll be working with our evaluators uh, to determine both the combination of what evaluations can be do, done remotely and remain and keep their reliability and validity. Um, and then uh, safety and health protocols uh, for in-person evaluations as well. So we'll be able to do the evaluation process um, and different than it was in the spring, we will be holding a lot of meetings remotely. Although parents that can't do it remotely, we might welcome them in, uh, we won't put 10 or 15 people around a table. So it might be a hybrid model of in-person and remote IEP meetings, but we intend on holding all our IEP meetings to meet federal and state timelines. Uh, where in the past we were like, ah, we can't, right now we have a system in place where we're, we're quite confident we can meet timelines um, and quite confident that we will be able to continue to evaluate. I do need to get in there and meet with the, S the speech language pathologist and our psychologist and our, our some of them will be a little bit, physical therapy is a little bit harder to actually do the evaluations due to the proximity, but I feel quite confident that we'll be able to figure out uh, how to get the data and the information we need to find, I think what you're asking is new students eligible for IEPs, and certainly that process will be in place. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Julie. Lynn, you, you got a question for Karen? Hello? 
Hello, Lynn. Where are you? Control D. <laughs> Hold on. Um, well, we'll there get you are. There we go. Okay. Sorry, everything froze up there for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about ELL students. Yes. Um, and hearing, first of all, qu first question, would they be coming in at the beginning of the remote, those first two weeks of remote learning? I do want to, because it doesn't fall, I see Sarah put her hand up. Uh, that doesn't fall in special education, so I'm going to defer back to Sarah Mitchell. Okay. Yeah, Lynn. So we are looking at that population for getting extra supports during that initial. We're we're wrapping them into our what we're considering high need learners. So we mm -hmm. just got to figure out the logistics of that. But yeah, they are a group that we're looking at to provide some more for. My second question, then, um, as someone with hearing loss, I really rely on being able to see people's lips to understand what they're saying. Would ELL students be better served, and I realize this might be a technology issue with them, um, but would they be better served in school or at home where they could at least see a person, a teacher's mouth? That, that's a great question, and I'm not sure Sarah was going to jump in, but I'll jump in on that one. The first thing I just want to say is, uh, you know, I work very closely with our teacher of the hearing impaired um, and our audiologist. And very early on, uh, when it was hard to get uh, PPEs and uh, uh, worked with them to do a bulk order of clear masks. Uh, mm -hmm. So we will have those available uh, throughout the district. And we have a number of those available for the district, especially uh, for our high need students and students with social pragmatic issues uh, where the teachers will be able to wear those. And it also does bring up um, how large this continuum is. Even for students with special needs, we do recognize uh, that um, as much as we understand that an increase in in-person is necessary, we have had a few parents um, and a few students in which uh, we understand that remote uh, is a way to work with them. And we can, uh, so we can individualize and talk about that, but we can also have access. Um, one of the things we'll be doing, especially with speech language pathologists or some other ways is have kids in the building, but accessing certain things while remaining in their classroom and uh, the related service provider provides the service remotely while they're in school. So it will be a large continuum. I hope that answered your question. I'm not um, yeah, sure if we consider that completely for ELL students, whether or not they would um, be completely remote. But we, we're in a position to communicate with families um, and, and individualize. Yeah, I'd also like to add, Lynn, that uh, the third population that we're looking at is, as high need are students that don't have any internet access. Um, so mm -hmm. making sure that all students can access the remote learning. Thank you. Are you still talking about maybe doing something in the gym with for some of those kids that need? Um, yeah, we're calling it our we're calling it our internet cafe. So we're looking at the gym um, for our high school students, and um, you know possibly a, a tent or the media center for our middle school students because we also want to be conscious of those um, cohort groups that we're creating. Do we have Do we have a number of how many people? that don't have internet service do, do um, we have here? We're looking at about, um, I think we're at about 50 students that are looking at using that service. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. Does anybody else have any questions about this? If not, um, we are gonna go into a- I do build for club. If you don't mind, I just wanted to clarify with um Sarah. So when you say 50, you mean 50 across the cohorts, not 50 kids in the gym. Correct. Correct. Yeah, no, no, we're not going to. Yeah, we'll just cram them all in there. Forget about yep. the social distancing. Yeah, no, it's, it's 50 across all the cohorts. And so we'd be looking at that's middle school and high school. And so okay. we'd be looking at really dividing those way down uh, so there's lots of space yeah so it would really defeat the purpose if we right. did all that yeah <laughs> okay thank you good question okay uh if no one else has it go okay, ahead just jump in real quick if you don't mind the so i, I saw in the chat because it's a good question you have parents watching they're like so you kind of turned the list upside down a little bit when are you going to communicate that out so kind of you know our general next step of communication is 
you know, right now we're getting this out to the teachers, trying to get a little feedback on that before we kind of finalize it. I imagine early next week, we're looking at getting information out to parents, um, possibly setting up a town hall as well for remote and in-person parents to answer any individual questions. And so that kind of thing would happen over into next week. And then um, I don't know when the, the Sarah, do you have an idea or George or Scott, they, when guidance schedules are gonna be somewhat ready. But there's a lot of moving parts of information that we put together um, this week. And so um, I know parents wanna, we wanna get that as soon as possible, but we don't wanna send out one set of information and have to retract it because we missed something as um, teachers go through it. Sarah? Yeah, so guidance is, their first uh, official day is tomorrow. They're so excited. Um, <laughs> and so we're looking at getting those schedules in place. That's step one. We started our preliminary splitting of the cohorts uh, today for the high school. And what's, what needs to happen, the process that needs to happen is we split them arbitrarily by alphabet. And then what needs to happen is the class numbers need to run. And then we need to really look at the class numbers and make sure that we didn't end up with 18 in this class and two in that class and then do some shuffling. So it's gonna be a, a bit of a process to figure out um, exactly what those cohorts will look like at the high school level. Middle school, they're in pretty good shape. They've really drilled down to the details there. Um, so we're hoping to send it all out at once so we're not communicating and then re-communicating. Right. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. So if there's nothing else, uh, we do have an executive session. We are going to go into executive session for school committee members. Um, Darius, are we inviting in Sarah and George and Scott? Are we? No. No? Okay. No. We're not just, allowed in. Okay. You know, so regarding, just so people know, the negotiations, we, we, I keep the you know, direct administrators out of that um, because it's, you know, it's not where they're yeah. where I didn't know if we had to or not. So I just figure yeah. I, if we have to invite you. So, so you're not going to return. You're not going to return to do any more business. So you're going to be, you are going to only, um, you'll be adjourning from there. So there'd be no other future business coming out of executive session. So those watching cool. don't have to sit around and wait for, to see nothing. So I need a motion to go into executive session, uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, in discussion with collective bargaining with teachers and aides. Do so I have a motion, motion, Chair? Thank you, Bill. Do I have a second? second? Yeah, I will. Who's that? Judy. Thank you, Judy. Yeah. Roll call, please. Bob Halla? Yes. McFarland? Coming back. Wave, wave, Keith. Damian Fosnott? Yes. Bill Smith? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Olivia Leone? Yes. Judy Pierce, yes. Ashley Dion? Yes. Philip Cantor? Yes. Melissa Novak? Yes. That's a yes. Uh, Lynn yes. Roberts? Yep. Yep. And uh, Keith? You back? Yes. Thanks. Okay, everybody, we're going to go out of this one and we'll see you in the executive session.